I have with me today Samantha from Bee Baby. Hi, Samantha. Would you like to introduce yourself for everyone? Hi. Yeah. Hi, Rivka. Hi, everyone. Um, nice to be able to have a discussion with you this morning. My name is Samantha. I am a registered nurse clinician, and I am the CEO and the founder of Bee Baby, which is an all-inclusive one-stop shop parent incubator program that we offer um, all over North America. And you're also a mother yourself and a very busy woman, I think. Yeah, I am the mother of three under three. Well, at this point, three, three and under um, and, and run a business from home while my children are, are home full time with me as well. So very busy. So how did you get into working with uh, families during their childbearing years? Well, I became a nurse some, gosh, I don't want to age myself, but almost 15 years ago at this point. And I worked in various fields. I started in the ICU and and worked through different departments and into uh, private care at some point. And I went back to further my studies a few years ago, and I studied epigenetics in particular. And epigenetics are related to how your environmental factors and your genetic factors intermingle to develop your physical health, emotional health, um, and so on as you are growing older. So, of course, when you're talking about epigenetics, um, the first few months, the first few years, as well as, you know, your development within pregnancy comes to mind. It's a big, big subject because that is where epigenetics has its strongest roots and impacts. And um, I had to do a community research project to highlight a gap or a need in our communities. And I was actually pregnant at the time. So I decided to focus my community research on um, maternal care and postpartum care. And I quickly realized through that research, but also through the care that I was trying to get while I was pregnant, that we had some serious gaps and serious issues in, in terms of maternal care and postpartum care. And that's why I decided from that point on um, to focus my attention on those areas to find, you know, what the main issues were in terms of access to care and quality of care and to fill that gap. So what do you think those main issues are? I think in terms of pregnancy care, there's a few. There's a lack of access to information from the very beginning. You know, when you become pregnant, you don't know which care providers are available to you. I didn't know, even as a nurse, which care providers were available to me. I believed, even as a nurse, that my only option was an obstetrician because most of our family physicians today will not do our pregnancy care and um, labor and delivery. And I didn't know about midwives. So mind you, I went to school for many, many years in nursing care, and never was it mentioned that we in Quebec or in other provinces had access to midwives. Um, so once I became pregnant, the first thing that I did was, you know, find an obstetrician, ask my friend who had had children who her obstetrician was and, and go ahead and do that. Um, but when I went for my first appointment, I realized that wasn't really what I was expecting. The appointment with the obstetrician himself or herself was less than five minutes. And as a first time mom, I was a little bit destabilized that this is all, that's all, that's all I would be getting. And then beyond that, we had, you know, public um, health prenatal courses that had little to no useful information to me within them. And so um, I did a lot of research. And from there, I was able to find out about, you know, midwifery care. I was able to find out that there are family physicians that are specialized in um, 
prenatal care and, and childbirth and labor and delivery and all of the options that are really available to us. Um, and I realized that most women from the very start, we just don't know that we have options. And unfortunately in Quebec, if you want a chance to have a midwife, um, you have to sign up very, very early in your pregnancy. So unless you know before you become pregnant, there is a very small chance of you actually getting a midwife. So I think that was the first gap, you know, that I identified. And then obviously within the care itself, when we're going into the standard obstetrician, physician care um, in, pre, in the prenatal, um, there's a lack of education and preparation towards childbirth itself. We sort of kind of expect women to show up to give birth with no desires, no birth plan, no idea really of what they want or don't want, and then to just be a good patient and follow the rules and follow what is recommended to them to make it easier on the staff itself. Um, and so what happens is we have women walking into, you know, childbirth that sometimes don't even know that they will have to birth a placenta after giving birth to their babies, right? And obviously, when you're walking in with little to no knowledge, and you you, te you technically end up walking in often way too early in your labor, and scared, and worried, and afraid, which inevitably will thrust you down the line of all the medical interventions that will sort of add on to one another and lead to one another the medical cascade, as we call it. And again, throughout those interventions, informed consent or true informed consent is never actually seeked. Um, I find that we have a huge discussion in our culture today about seeking consent with women, you know, in terms of sexuality and dating and all of these things. We're really putting a big point on it but we're completely overlooking still the lack of, of consent that we are getting from women in labor um, and in delivery rooms and even in pregnancy care. So I think there's a big gap there and it has to do a little bit as to how um, obstetrical care was started some hundred years ago. Um, when it was started, you know, back then, women weren't actually considered people, right? We, we didn't have the right to vote. We didn't have the right to own land. We didn't have the right to own money. We didn't have really any rights whatsoever. And that's when obstetrical care was founded. And although we've made great strides in um, our placement within society today, the foundation itself was kind of rotten, Right. And so we're trying to fix something by repainting it, but the foundation needs to go and, and we need to start over again. And so when you're entering as a woman in this you know, world of maternal care, you're entering at a distinct disadvantage and you're going to have to climb a huge mountain in front of you. And it's unfortunate, but it is the reality. And so if women want to truly be well protected and have good experiences, you know, in terms of childbirth and delivery and all that, they need a lot of information, guidance and support. So that's the gap that's in, you know, the, the maternal care. And then after you give birth, well, within, you know, 24 hours, 48 hours, they say, OK, fantastic. Here's the door. Good luck. And then you exit the hospital or, you know, the midwifery care center, what have you, and you go home and now you're all alone. And then when you have questions or concerns, we don't really have that village of wise women that we once had before, right? That was available to help you, that had the experience, that had the knowledge. Most of our parents are still working. Many of us live far away from family. And so when we, we, when we have concerns, we have to turn to the CLSC nurse, the pediatrician, your own physician, the Facebook mothers groups, the blogs, the... Um, lactation consultant, the sleep consultant, the like a whole host of different people who then 
you know, are giving you conflicting advice. And in the end, mom is sitting in the middle and she's more confused than ever. And so that's way too complicated. Once you've just had a baby, you don't have the time to start, you know, putting everything down in an Excel sheet and trying to determine who's right and who's wrong and what you should do and what you shouldn't do. You shouldn't be spending all this time trying to figure out basic answers to your questions, right? There should be somebody available to answer your questions quickly, safely, and in respect to your own needs and desires. So those are the major gaps that we identified um, and the lack of support that comes along with that. And that's what we aim to fill. Well, that's great because there indeed is a huge gap, and uh, and I like how you how you describe the foundations. We do need to completely gut the house and build it up again for sure. Absolutely, I think you know, um, we're we're trying to paint the walls. We're trying to change, you know, the decoration. We're trying to fix, you know, one door handle at a time but the whole foundation is just falling apart, right? So no matter how many times we paint or no matter how many cute decorations we add, we're never truly going to have fixed the problem itself. We have to start all over again. Yeah. So back to you, your life seems to be very busy and it's very organic in the sense that um, you are mothering, you are mothering mothers, you're living, you're living a, a very intentional life Um, how do you keep focused? I think that very early on in our parenting journey, me and my husband actually went into parenting, um, with the expectations of having, you know, your traditional life, right? We were going to have one or two children. They were going to go to daycare. We were both going to have strong careers. We were going to live in the suburbs where we were. They were going to go to private school, you know, right next to our house. And that's really as far as, you know, our thought process had gone. They were all going to have, you know, RESPs for their student funds. And and that's just really it, right? We wanted to give them the best. And um, as we progressed in the first year, I'd say, of our first child's life, um, our desires, our expectations in in terms of our life changed dramatically. And we decided together through a conversation that we were going to be very purposeful in our decision making in terms of our children, but also in terms of our family, our careers, and our lifestyle. And so we actually have a process that every time We have a big decision to make, you know, that, for example, was I going to go back to work? Well, instead of just saying, well, culturally, most women go back to work, so that's what I'm going to do, right? Instead of doing that, we actually sat down one night and we do the same thing every time. We have a huge uh, dollar store board and markers and we write down every single option that most people won't consider and we do research, We read books, we watch documentaries, we speak to people in those various options, and we write down the pros and cons. And then we look at it from the perspective of what would our perfect life look like in terms of flexibility, in terms of time, in terms of family dynamics, in terms of um, having our children be able to grow in a less limited mind space, for example. And so we make our decisions based on that. And because we do that at every single turn, we ended up down the road of a quite a different lifestyle than most people. So we have, you know, three children very close in age and we're not done. We'd like to have, you know, at least two more. We live in the very deep country in the middle of the woods and and we hit heat by by wood. We have electricity, but we, we heat by wood and we cut our own wood and we have, you know, 15 chickens in in the background. We live our summers in an RV on an island. Um, My kids are homeschooling as well. I did start my own company, but I work from home and my entire company is structured in a way that I can respect my family um, balance in itself. Um, Our birthing choices have also been very different from 
the vast majority, right? I had midwife twice and then I had a free birth um, for, for my third. And so I think that what we decided to do was we realized at some point that we were living not the life that we specifically wanted to live, but perhaps the life that society and our parents and our friends and our family were telling us we should want. And we we stopped ourselves in our tracks and we thought, yeah, okay, but do we have to or are there other options? And if there are other options, which one is right for us, right? And so instead of looking at every single decision in, in terms of, you know, that specific decision, we actually made you know, a board of what our ideal lifestyle would look like in terms of flexibility and family life balance and financial freedom and time spent with our children and the type of education we wanted our children to have and all of those things. And then every decision we make now is made in consequence of, will this decision allow us now and in the future to have all of these things. And so we don't exactly know what the final picture is exactly going to look like, but what we do know is throughout the process, we will have spent, you know, as much time with our children as possible. We will have hopefully raised children that are critical thinkers and who question things and and don't just go with societal flow. Um, that we will have protected our marriage in terms of, of parenting and, and all of these things, that we will uh, be able to live a comfortable life, but also feel like we're contributing to society and be proud of ourselves and of the work that we do and inspire people around us to have the flexibility to live wherever in the world that we want to live in at this particular time, but also have the financial comfort of, of, of being able to do these things without being, you know, um, stuck in a corner. Well, that's, uh, that's amazing what, what your family is doing. It really is. Back to, back to birthing mothers. Let's say a first time mother is wondering what on earth to do. She's wondering where and with whom to give birth. She knows nothing about the maternity care system. She finds you. What advice would you give her? Well, the first thing that we do is um, we ask her, you know, what her aspirations are. Does she already have some sort of an image in her mind that she constructed as a young girl of what parenthood's going to look like and, and what birthing might look like? What was her mother's birthing experience? Is she coming from a place of fear and anxiety? Um, And then from there on, we'll make sure that she gets the education and the presentation of all the options that are ahead of her, right? So I think it's important when you're pregnant, we put a lot of time and effort into planning the nursery, right? We spend hours on Pinterest planning that nursery and that baby registry. And some of us will build, you know, Excel spreadsheets to figure out which stroller is the best. And I think it's important to realize that childbirth is a transformational experience for every single woman who goes through it, no matter what type of childbirth experience she had. It is transformational. It is a huge experience. It's also your very first date with your child, right? And so I think it makes the most sense in the world to spend at the very least as much time and hopefully more getting educated and prepared and making plans for birth as you do preparing your registry or your nursery, right? Because which stroller you end up driving is not going to have as deep of an impact on your maternal journey than the, the type of pregnancy care and birth experience and postpartum experience that you have as a mother. So I encourage women, we give them all the resources necessary to um, unbiasedly know, you know, the difference in care at all levels. And we'll have discussions with them to figure out in terms of where they are, which option is best. And we dive, you know, deep into understanding what the history of obstetrics is and dismantling, you know, 
the societal and the cultural fear that we've associated to birth as though it was this inherently dangerous thing akin to going to war. And then from that moment, once we've done that, we're able to replace that thought and that imagery with what is physiological childbirth? What does it look like, right? And and then we'll talk about, you know, different medical interventions and, and when they are appropriate, when they're not appropriate. And we'll talk a lot about informed consent, because oftentimes when we're going into, you know, the labor and delivery ward, um, we see our physicians and our care providers with so much authority on us, right? It's that patient to care provider relationship. And so when the doctor or the nurse tells you do this and that, but your body is telling you otherwise, like if they're telling you lay down on your back, but your body is telling you, no, 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 I need to be bent over this bed. This is what feels good to me right now. We tend to listen to the physician because we feel like we will be a bad patient if we don't, and we're going to be putting our baby at risk if we don't. So we kind of have to break that down. And so we help mothers understand that there's a reason why their brains send them specific messages in labor and delivery, because their brain is in direct communication with their bodies, with their pelvic outlets, with their uteruses, with you know their babies. And we've gone so far into a rational society that we no longer put any weight or trust on this instinctual thinking. But this instinctual thinking is just as scientifically based as, you know, rational thinking itself. So one of the things that we do from the very beginning when we're doing this work is we ask mothers to refer to themselves as clients and not patients because a patient is sick. A patient is in need of saving. And when you're pregnant, you're not sick. You're not injured. You're not in need of saving. You are exercising your right to choose where, with whom, and how you want to birth your baby. What about the support that you provide uh, postpartum women? And and um, another question that was in my mind was, what about uh um, like doula support or um, other practitioners? Do you have a list of, of uh, people that you can refer to? Yes. So in our program, there's, you know, hours and hours of childbirth preparatory classes. We talk about every stage of labor, but we also have presentations that are given by um, doulas, for example, midwives, family physicians, and every single type of provider we could think of to tell them about that sort of access of care so that they can choose if it's something that they want. And then we have a list of resources that I've accumulated over the years of trusted people that I know that provide these services in different areas. So we help them, you know, build the perfect environment and the perfect group of support in order to have the childbirth experience that they need. And then from the moment that their babies are born, um, everybody says you need a village to raise a child, but unfortunately we don't really seem to have a village anymore. Right. And so we've created the village. So what we like to say is we'll scoop you up into our arms and we bring you into our all-inclusive resort. We'll grab your luggage and give you a drink and you can just go enjoy yourself and we'll service you, right? That's kind of like our goal. And so inside of a peace of mind parenting program, what we do is you have one-on-one consultations with me that include sleep education, uh, education, sorry, breastfeeding support and help and education, postpartum healing, connecting you with the right professionals if you're having, you know, pain or discomfort and what have you, giving you support and guiding you as you go through those first few weeks and months that can be a little bit more sensitive. We'll screen for postpartum depression and postpartum anxiety throughout the way We offer unlimited instant messaging support. So there's always someone at your fingertips if you have a question or a concern. Uh, We offer between five to 10 different sessions every single week based on our clients' needs. So you can attend sessions on breastfeeding. You can attend sessions on postpartum nutrition and how to really fuel your body in the postpartum period. We have sessions on 
appropriate fitness that you can do from home. So we have exercise, you know, um, sessions every single week provided by a fitness instructor that is based on postpartum health, right? On, on protecting your body and allowing you to regain some strength. And um, <clears throat> we have sessions on sleep. We have sessions on, you know, potty training. We have sessions on protecting your marriage as you transition to parenthood, how to prepare for your transfer back into your career or into being a stay at home mom. And so we really want to cater to all your needs. And we offer, you know, office hours every single week as well that you can drop into and ask questions. And everybody has their own personal travel sheet, right where we're looking at where they are. And we have a private community that's literally called the village um, and it's populated with physicians, with nurses, with midwives, with psychologists, with osteopaths, with a few doulas, with uh, our dietitian, our pharmacist, because you have a pop up on our website. So if you need something, the pharmacist will prescribe it and deliver it to your house. Um, we really give you that full all around service to make sure that you never feel alone. And you're never stuck on Google or in the middle of 500 different opinions trying to figure out what you should do. So we remove the pressure off of your shoulders and we accompany you. So the goal being that by the time that you exit the program, you're feeling really confident, right? You're feeling really happy and comfortable in your parenting journey. Because what I hear all the time is, well, I don't really remember the first five years of my kid's life because I was so tired. I was so stressed out. I was so overworked that it's it's just kind of a blur, right? Those years go by too quickly. And so I want that year or those years to be the best years of your life instead of being a blur. And so we've structured our program in such a way to allow you to do that. And every single session that we do is recorded. It's placed into your library. You can listen to it, you know, on your computer or on your phone as you're driving, as you're cooking, et cetera, et cetera. So no matter the question, no matter the concern, no matter the need, we make sure that you always get what you need within our program. And that's why we don't create, you know, hundreds of hours of pre-recorded video before we launch. We create as we are serving our clients because we don't want to create in a vacuum what we think you're going to need, right? We have some ideas, of course, but we want to make sure that we're always providing exactly what you need. So at the end of every week, I sit down and I look at every single client's travel sheet. And I'm like, oh, you know, her baby's about to be six months. She's going to be introducing solids. Let's talk about that this week. And uh, I find, you know, this mom has made some wonderful success in, in dealing with her anxiety, for example. Let's put the finishing touches on that. This mom is struggling with nutrition because of you know, high blood pressure. Let's talk about that. And so that's how we'll structure our sessions. And we have, you know, a birth trauma support group. Um, every four weeks, we have parent coffee groups every two weeks. So we really make sure that you have a safe space to go to. Well, that sounds wonderful. Um, I'll put the information on how you can reach that in the show notes, everyone. So you can look that up. Finally, um, how has the pandemic restricted your work and how do you think it has changed uh, the maternity system in our country? In terms of our own care, we have always been providing care uh, online. We were doing some birth accompaniment in person at some point, unfortunately, with the pandemic that that has restricted us you know, substantially. And so we do offer virtual support at the moment for many um, I think what the way we are, we were able to still grow, right, and, and continue to offer support because we were already ready and able and providing services online. So it actually grew our, 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 you know, the number of clients that came to us because we were already very experienced in the online world. However, it's changed the concerns and the needs of women substantially because mothering is already very um, isolating in this past year and a half, it has been extremely isolating. And so we have had to ramp up 
that community interaction and that connectiveness within our clients to make sure that really everyone does not feel isolated. But it's also changed the what birth is like for a lot of women, right? The induction rates have gone through the roof. The amount of, you know, birth trauma, uh, birth violence has gone through the roof. The amount of PTSD that I'm seeing after birth is, is, is huge. The amount of postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety is also huge. So we've actually added, you know, three psychologists to our services because, There was a serious need there. I think I expected from the beginning of the pandemic that perhaps um, because medical interventions are so invasive and so the transfer of the virus would be most probable that we would actually see a scaling back of medical interventions. But I was terribly wrong. And, and what we saw was the scaling upwards of all medical interventions, trying to gain more control over an uncontrollable physiological process. And um, women are more alone than ever, have less access to prenatal courses and all these things, which is why we offered them for free for for quite a few months this year um, to try and, and help prepare women because I feel like the pandemic has pushed us further down that rabbit hole. And, and so it's become even more dangerous, which is also why I personally even ended up having a free birth with my third, because there were literally no safe options where I was. Do you have, uh, do you have numbers on those, um, on those trends? I would love to write a blog post about that. That, that is what I have been suspecting, but, um, but I don't have any numbers. I will try and and pull some. I know that um, I have access to a lot of midwives, physicians, obstetricians, et cetera, who who speak to me privately, you know, off the record and um, have told me a little bit of the rates that are going on in their own areas of practice and some of the, the news that's been going on. It's not only in Canada and France. It has like exploded as well. Um, And they have all come to me and told me, you know, even some people who are very pro medical intervention at some point have messaged me and said, okay, at this point, I'm terrified. Wow. It's going too far. I have midwives who are wanting to, you know, walk out and, and go under the record because they're just, it's not what they signed up for. Yeah. Well, I'm hearing that from the women themselves, but I, uh, all of my information is just anecdotal. So if there are any numbers there that we can, that we can grasp and share, I think that would be really useful. Yes, absolutely. I mean, we can even just look back at some of the hospital policies that were put in place. There was a hospital, I believe it was in Hawkesbury, um, that was making the epidural an obligation to all laboring women from the moment they entered their hospital at some point. Goodness. Yeah. No wonder people are calling me wanting to birth at home. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, for a long time, there was no support person allowed, not even your husband. Or you're allowed to have your husband, but you're not allowed to have your doula. Well, well that's that's still in place. Exactly. That, that's still in place. And that's so traumatizing for women that have, that have dreamed of that, you know, close uh, physical presence of a doula. It's, it's shocking that they're not allowing doulas in the hospital. And it's quite dangerous, too, because let's be honest, especially as a first time mom, I mean, your husband hasn't gone through doula training, has never seen birth, is is not a woman, you know, doesn't understand what you're going through. And so he might want to support you as best as he does. But once he sees you in pain and discomfort, his faces, his expressions, the things that he says might actually guilt you into doing something that you didn't want to do because you feel like you're making people uncomfortable, right? That doula is that protective aura in your birthing room she's holding that space she's reading your expressions and your tones of voices and providing the support and the guidance that you need before you even need to express it it's always been a part of birth for as long as birth has ever you know existed there's always been a doula there even if there was no name for it so today going into birth with a you know a first time husband who doesn't really know anything about it and what have you or a second time or even the third time without a doula within a system that is so structured and so pushy and and bullying um 
it's extremely dangerous and extremely traumatizing, like you said, also, because in the end, you kind of feel like you were alone for those 25, 40 hours of labor. Exactly. Well, it's been wonderful speaking with you. I have my final question, which I ask everyone. If you just had one word to share with our listeners, what would that be? Um, goodness gracious, that is a good question. There's so many words. I think one word, it would have to be village. You need to find your village. At this point in time in our society, more importantly than ever, we all need to be putting in great focus our ability to find our village. And that might not be in person for many of us, but you need to find the right safe village that will support you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Thank you, Samantha. And I'll, I'll certainly put all of your information out on the show notes so everyone can get in touch with you. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a great pleasure as always. <laughs>